Oh, hey. Hey, don't tune out. You've got the right video. Right about now, you're wondering, why aren't I showing a video of the valve disassembly and rebuild? Well, here's the deal. I accidentally erased one video clip. So, what, we are, what you're about to see is basically, we're gonna pick up the valve rebuild where the next video clip started. Meanwhile, this is gonna be in an upcoming episode where I prepped the system to get the valve back in the tractor. So look forward to that coming soon. But the other thing I did last night was I printed out the PDF manual that I found on the Parker um, Hydraulics website, which is the Hydra, Hydra Guide HGA-10 manual. If you Google that, it'll come up right near the top. It's the Parker website. Uh, Parker and Ross and TRW are somehow all interconnected. But that is the official manual from the manufacturer on rebuilding these. So I reread that and realized that before I can tighten this cover down, what I need to do is I need to have this spool reinserted from this end correctly and this cover installed. And they actually recommend that as you're tightening, as you're doing the tightening procedure to these bolts, which is a certain pattern, which I'll show you, uh, that you actually rotate this input shaft periodically as you're doing it to stop binding. Because this cover and this ring can shift position independently of the body of the thing. And what's holding that all in alignment is basically the spool being in there. So I'm going to turn my attention back to the top here. The other thing I noticed, which I may have to take this cover off again. Uh, luckily, I haven't tightened it down yet, so no harm, no foul. But that disc that's on this end cover, it rides on a pin. Uh, they mentioned that that will oftentimes stick to this cover. But I guess that should be installed on the top of the rotors before you put this cover back on. How critical that's going to be, I don't know. Uh, so if I have trouble getting this to seat correctly and putting this back together on the top, then I will assume that I've got a problem with alignment down here that I've got to straighten out. So, so some of the steps that are uh, involved in the reassembly here have to do with the disassembly and reassembly of this spool unit there's a retaining ring here that I never took off. There's a spacing washer here. There's this wavy washer. All of that I've left alone because I didn't want to mess with it. So I've loosened this back up. Um, so now I'm going to stand this up. I'm going to take the uh, spool assembly back out because I forgot that this sleeve has to go on under this spacer. And I never took this snap ring off because I didn't want to get into that disassembly just in case I didn't need to. And it looks like this wavy washer is going to sit on top of this. Yeah, it looks like according to the parts diagram, that wavy washer is in front of this sleeve. Oh, so there's a rod with a pin that goes crossways through it that has to engage just right down there. Okay, so... I got it. Next up, I need to install the shims. In my particular situation, I have a total of four shims that stack together. I'm sorry, it looks like five. <laughs> if you uh, end up having to replace this cover because it's damaged or cracked or whatever, um, or any of these other components down here, then you can't just reuse the shims you're going to have to figure out what you need for shims to get the proper amount of turning force and there's a whole long procedure for that a whole involved procedure for that that i'm not going to get into because i'm not replacing any of those parts uh thankfully so the next thing i need to do is insert the new needle bearing that i bought to replace my old one um the old one was really kind of crunchy 
and rather than try and clean all the grit out of it, I just bought a new one. So there's not much of a lip on the inside here to tell me how far to drive this bearing in. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if that's a lip at all. That might be just a that might be just a mark of uh, a line of rust or something. Yeah, that does not feel like a lip. Interesting. So in retrospect, I really wish I had taken a measurement from this top lip here down to the top of the bearing so I would know exactly how far to put that bearing in because there is no lip there. What I decided to go with is I press this bearing down so that this lip is right at the line where the chamfer meets. This chamfered area here, I believe that that exists to have a place for the end of this snap ring to live. So I think we're going to be okay. Uh, I don't think orientation of this cover on here is critical, but I am going to use the two witness marks right here that indicate that they were lined up over this uh, uh, ball valve here and this thing over here. And my mistake, the two ball valves. And before I put this cover on, I have to put in the what they refer to as a seal in this groove right here, which is more correctly like a square cut o-ring or whatever. So I'm hoping that that was included in this HG5 whatever kit because I do see a bunch of them in here. I'm going to leave everything else in that bag for now. Take out the two rings that are the possible correct ones for this. All right, that's possibility number one. I would say that's probably the correct one because it's it's the same width as this gap. So I believe this is going to have to come down and sit down here like this. Yeah, that's I don't like that. That would be a miracle if that goes into position. Huh. I like them apples. I think maybe I'll use a little dab of grease to just hold this in position and try and lower it in. So they do recommend in the instructions that before you take this top cover off that you should make a punch mark on the cover and a punch mark on the body so that you can line it up the same way as you took it off if you're going to reuse the cover. So it's lucky for me that it had those witness marks that I could I could line up and use to figure out which orientation this, this uses. And then uh, it also says to coat that uh, seal with uh, grease so it stays in the groove. So it turns out that I did that right. And that keeps the seal from falling out of the groove when you're putting this on. Then the shims... When you go to lower the cover on, the shims have a little bit of trouble getting it to position. So instead what I did was I put the shims uh, inside the, this part of the cover, tilted the whole thing, and put it together that way. Once you get it to this point, you're supposed to finger tight these four screws. And then they, were, they recommend using what they call either a pilot ring or a worm drive type hose clamp, which is a regular hose clamp, to align the cover in position to the body so what they're talking about is they're talking about the little bit of play that you get through these through holes in the cover would allow this to maybe shift around a little bit so what they want is they want you to put a clamp or something on here i happen to have a piston ring compression sleeve that is the perfect size for this there is a little ridge on the body right there so you can't go down any further than that little ridge right there so there's not much to grab onto on the body all right but if i get this in position all right so that should take care of the alignment they're talking about now again the four screws the heads on the four screws here they are almost like star type screws so you need a multi-point Five sixteenths. And I believe these are torqued to 18 to 22 pounds, foot pounds. Yeah, 18 to 22 foot pounds. All right, uh, these four bolts, again, 18 to 24 foot, 18 to 22 foot pounds, so I split the difference. 20 foot pounds is what I set them to. 
Uh, now I want to mount this thing with this end facing up. Uh, the way the manual suggests to do this is to actually take one of these fittings out and mount a, uh, an, another fitting with flats on it in there and then clamp that fitting in a vise. Uh, I happen to be fortunate enough I have this call it closer thing so it'll be easy for me to uh, just slap this in here. Yeah, that's good. So that's not going to go anywhere. So I had started to reassemble, reassemble this uh, back half before I realized that I needed this front cap on to do it properly. So I'm taking it back off again. Uh, so this tape I have on the back here, this is just the bolt tightening pattern of the seven bolts that I put on here. And uh, I also made a mark so I know which one of these bolt holes lines up where. So I can orient this cover the same way as I take it off. I don't think this cover, I don't think it mentions anything about this cover marking it so that you put it in the same exact position like the cover on the top. But if we pull this up, you can see this disc right here is the thing they're talking about that might stay behind or it might come off like that. They warn you not to try and take this pin out. I don't know why you would want to, but so that's pressed into the cover and it's a non-replaceable part. I guess if that pin wears out or breaks, they don't want you to try and do anything about it. So this sticking up at an angle like this already looks wrong. I think that that has shifted out of position from all the work I was doing on the other side. Or just rereading that warning, it actually is calling this disc right here a commutator and it's saying there's a washer underneath here. Yep, right there, there's a washer. So you gotta be careful that that doesn't fall out if you take this off. The next step is to remove this large ring right here that holds this seal in place. Because uh, I just had mine apart, it comes right apart. You might have to give this a soft bump with a non, uh, you know, a plastic mallet or something to break it free. And lift it off like so. And then remove the seal and discard that seal. This is my brand new seal in here, so obviously I'm not going to do that. If the commutator and washer did not come off with the end cover like this and stayed in here you would this is at this point you would remove those then you remove this ring that ring is called the commutator ring and it's a delicate part you got to be careful you don't want to mar it nick it damage it in any way next part is this device right here which is called the manifold and the same thing with this you want to remove it in the same Way with the same amount of caution. Next we're going to move what's called the rotor set, the spacer, and the drive length as an the drive link as an assembly. So that's this device, this rotor on the inside, and the spacer underneath here. So I grab the spacer and this whole unit comes up as an assembly. And you want to keep this together. On the rotor there are little tiny veins with little tiny springs behind them, little uh, um, sp spring steel pieces of curved metal that act as springs. On some of these units, those don't exist. On the ones that have wider rotors, on the ones that have rotors that are three quarters of an inch or less in width, they have these little veins. So you don't want to take any of this apart unless you absolutely have to. Oops. Alright, well I guess that can't go anywhere. So I just took this drive link out of this assembly. In order to do that, you have to slide this top assembly on the spacer so that it lines up with the hole, and then you can pull it up through this toothed area. Then there's a, a pin down there with a cross pin through it that goes in a slot in the bottom of this piece. Right there, that slot is where that pin has to live. You'll know you have it incorrectly because it won't go it won't go in down that far if it's not. And there's a whole section in the manual of doing inspection of these parts which I'm not going to do because my unit was working it was just leaking so I don't believe I have a problem with uh, pressure when it has enough fluid in it. It just loses fluid because of the leakage problems so uh, I'm going to just move ahead with reassembly. Not only that but if any of these major components are worn um, Due to the cost of some of these components, I probably at that point would just opt for a rebuilt unit 
So this spacer goes on next. The plain side faces up. In other words, this flat side. The other side has all those grooves in it. Next, I'm going to install the rotor assembly. Just put a couple of bolts in to get the alignment right. Next up is the manifold. And you want to make sure that these slotted holes, these circular slotted holes, face up. Next part is the commutator ring. Um, the instructions say that this should be installed with the slot side down. And I had this down on the bench the way I took it off, which was this way. So my slot side, I think, was facing up, which is interesting. So my first thought was, well, is the manual wrong? But I looked at the exploded view. You can see, clearly see that the slot side is in the picture, and it would be facing this way, down. And they even have a photograph showing it being installed and an arrow pointing to this, describing this as the slot in question. So this definitely should go slot side down like so. It'll be interesting when I'm editing this video, I'm going to have to take, take a look and see whether or not that slot was facing up when I took this apart the first time. The next step is to remove this large ring right here that Next up is the rotor seal and the rotor seal retainer, which is this large metal band. Now, when I first read this next paragraph in the instructions, I have to admit I was kind of flummoxed. It took me a few minutes to figure it out, but I, now I have a grasp on it. Let me just read it to you the way that it's, it's printed. To allow for washer 37, assemble commutator 34 with counterbore up into commutator ring 33 with slotted hole in commutator engaging nose of drive link 30. Align commutator outside diameter concentric with inside diameter of commutator ring. Mm. So the commutator is this thing. And what they're basically saying is because on the end cover there's a washer there, to allow space for that washer to exist, they want this little counterboard area right here up against the end cover or facing up, this facing up. So to allow for washer 37, assemble commutator 34 with counterbore up into the commutator ring that's this, with slotted hole in commutator engaging nose of drive link. So you see how this is tilted over? They don't want you putting it in that hole in the middle because that's going to be where that pin sits, right? They want that like that. Align commutator outside diameter concentric with inside diameter of commutator ring. So this is the commutator ring. There's an inside diameter there. Oops. And there's an outside diameter here. And what they basically are saying is try and align this so that this space is even all the way around. Then they tell you that you could put a dab of grease on the underside of this washer to keep this washer from falling off when you invert this. And then they want you to install this end cover so this pin engages that hole. Now I've already started torquing these bolts down. Um, I don't know if you could see it from this angle, but there was a really big space in here. And that, that's what was normal that gave me pause when I first saw it today. The, the seal is actually much taller and it gets squeezed down and compressed and that actually is what creates that sealing action. So the idea is there's a pattern you want to follow in tightening these these uh, seven bolts and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You want to torque these bolts two to three foot pounds each in sequence until you get to a final torque value of 15 to 19 foot-pounds. So if you follow me, 
when we're done, we want these all to be torqued down to 15 to 19 pounds, but we don't want to go right to 15 pounds and torque this down because it'll be uneven. It'll be uneven pressure put on that seal and it'll, it'll damage it. So what you do is you start off by finger tight and then I'm using my drill with the clutch at the like weakest setting and I start with that. Once I do that a couple of times, now I'll move to my uh, inch pound driver. So I have this handy inch pound unit and this basically gives me the ability to do um, 12, 24, up to 48 inch pounds, which is 48 inch pounds is four foot pounds. I'll set this pointer to 24 inch pounds, which is the two foot pounds. I'll start at number one. You see, I'm turning this until that needle gets up to, there we go. Now I'm gonna to go to number two and repeat. Now I come back to number one and want number one is very loose again. So I retorque number one, two more foot pounds and repeat. Eventually I get to a point where I can't torque these any more than two to three foot pounds. They also say while you're doing this tightening, step two, which is the final torque value, to actually rotate the input shaft to eliminate binding. I guess that's just to keep everything lined up as you're going along, I don't know. But I'm, I'm doing it as I go. I'm not gonna wait till I get it almost completely torqued up. But that feels pretty good. This is my uh, inch pound torque wrench. So, you know, conversion from inch pounds to foot pounds is the easiest thing. You got 12 inches, 12 inch pounds and one foot pound, 12 inches and a foot. All right, last round of tightening. This is uh, 228 inch pounds, which is 19 foot pounds. Feels good, no binding. All right, I guess I'll call it quits for tonight and tomorrow I'll install the new seals in this top section.